Welcome to Sleepless Running Plays. Today we're going to be looking at Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon by Awakened Games. I'm going to be running through a very simple beginner scenario, just an explanation of how to play the game and run through the basic mechanics. I'll be have put links for Awakened Games and all their wonderful products and Kickstarters down below. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them, but I do enjoy their games quite a bit. So, with that being said, here is Tainted Grail, The Fall of Avalon. What I'm going to be running through is the starting scenario that is called the Start Here volume in the Tainted Grail box. It's essentially just going to be a really quick tutorial. I'm going to do this because some people I know learn rules better by watching or by listening rather than just by reading a piece of paper. I'm going to be including story in this as well, so sit back and enjoy as I read some various things. They still call this place a farm hold. Even though barren fields provide little food and crumbling walls offer no protection. The last relic of the glory days of Kunalakt is his men here, always adorned with red ribbons, lit by candles, with a daily offering at its gnarled feet. As long as the men here repels the weirdness, the townsfolks are ready to endure anything. The last night, the weirdness came closer than ever before. A man was lost, following the call of his future self. A house on the outskirts of town has turned inside out, its furniture grown into a bloated outer shell, like barnacles on the side of a boat. For many hours, the air tastes of metal and sour milk. Now people say your guardian men here is failing, like many others all over the land. For you, the night was even worse. The festering wound in your side throbbed as if something tried to tear itself free and join the rolling clouds of weird outside of town. In the morning, a boy, came, a boy comes running to your shack. Master Erfer needs to see you. Move, you big goof. You chase the brat away with a well-aimed throw of a boot. They immediately start to regret it, as the brute lands in a deep puddle of water outside your door. Now we're going to begin by the very basic things. We're going to set up our character. Today we're setting up Beor. He's the uh, local blacksmith in the for this adventure. There are four other characters, one of which is kind of odd. So we're going to take our character tray, which we're playing Beor means we're using the blue tray. His card has the setup side all located on it. So it's pretty easy to see how you should set things up. You take these common cubes, and you have two in aggression, one in courage, one in practicality, and one in caution. This is the combat side of your board. This is the diplomatic side of your board. He is not a very diplomatic individual. Then we take three cubes for food, place them there, and one cube goes in the well spot. You no longer need to see that side. So you can just insert him right there as it is, showing his ability and his affliction. We also need to take the uh, health marker. They have these interesting T-shaped markers. And uh, we're going to place it in the highlighted spot on the health track. The health track is the middle one, and on Bior, it's at the 9. You then take universal cubes and you place them in the starting slots where the chevrons mark them out. This means that Bior starts with six energy and no terror. If you're following along and you just got your brand new copy of the game, you at this point in time open the unpack and play deck, or the open and play deck. It's pretty simple. It's 35 cards. I have them already organized into the 1 through 15 of the combat deck, 1 through 15 of the diplomacy deck, in that order. And then there's the four encounter cards, which I'm going to set up off to this side over here. I like to make the gym in the center make a. It looks pretty if it's like all together, in my opinion. My character mini. The next thing we want to do. So you want to grab our starting location cards. They are these nice sized, really nice large cards. We're going to set up our starting location. I'm going to play with the cards going this way because of my limited space. Actually, I'm going to rotate them this way. Going this way because of my limited space in, in this in the play area I have. So just think of that as top, which should be facing that way, but we're going to place it this way today. So we lay out 101. That's the uh, 
Kunawakt Farm Hold. That's where we begin. Then we look and we see where the other cards go off of. 102. It's connected. 103. 104. Like I said, we're, we're limited on space. And 105. If this is your first time playing, actually for all the games in, the, in this thing, you probably want to get your help cards and take advantage of those. There's the Icon Glossary card, the Action Overview and Order of the Day card, and a Combat Overview card, the Diplomacy Overview. Oddly enough, there's only one of these Combat and Diplomacy Overview cards and four of these other ones. I don't know why they didn't give four of this one. But you probably want to place them nearby in case you need to reference them. So then we're going to take our character model, we're going to place him in our home location, then we're going to take the min here and place it in the home location as well, or any place that has the min here symbol, it's the third symbol on the uh, Kunawak farmstead. Then you take your min here coin, or your coin, dial, whatever these are called, and you're going to find the eight and place with the eight facing outward, telling us we have eight days remaining before it goes dark. This is pretty much a very standard setup, especially for a single player game on the first mission. But this is the tutorial mission, so it's a bit special. But it's a pretty standardized setup. We have our character, we have our men here, we have our locations, and we have all of our stuff set up. We're ready to begin playing. So we're going to back to one of those help cards. We're going to get out the order of the day side. So we're going to follow the order of the day side down the entire list at the start of the day. Remove the expired min here and discard locations that are out of min here range. All the locations are currently in min here range, which is one away from where it currently is. Reduce all time min here dials, removing time tokens. We don't have any time tokens, but we do have min here dials. So simply take the min here dial, find the seven, and return to there. Then we reveal the event card. However, because this is a tutorial mission, we do not have an event card. Instead, if you'll be on page three of the event of the uh, event guide, we have a event listed here. Quest: Speak with Kunox Blacksmith Urfir. Hint: To meet Urfir, you have to explore the Kunox Farmhold location. Okay, great. That's that's our that's our event. Woo! Then we move guardians. We don't have any guardians in play. That's something that happens more in the full game. And we don't have any items or secret cards, so we don't pick which ones are active of those either. So. We're just going to move on. We're going to begin with our first exploration. So at the start of the day, characters may perform actions. Each action in Tainted Grail is marked with a special icon, also showing its cost in your energy. So as our first action, we should try and find Urfir. The thing told us we should explore the Kunawak farmhold, so we're going to do that. So for that, we're going to go to the tutorial in the Exploration Journal, which is on the very last page of the Exploration Journal book. I have more story to read. So, Exploration Journal entries for most locations in Tainted Grail will start with an introduction that leads you to your decisions. Read the location introduction first. A deep feeling of loss pervades Kunawakt. From dilapidated farms to the sunken eyes of those who remain in town, the men here in the market is nearly extinguished. Still, this place is the only home you ever knew. Now you're ready to choose what to do in this location. Below are two options re redirecting you to different verses, paragraphs. Each has a requirement. The first time you come here, you're only able to choose the first option. Because the second one requires a specific part of your status, stories triggered marker that you mark on your, sa on your tutorial save sheet. If you're here for the second time, you should already have part two of this required status, so only the second object is accessible to you. Make your choice now. Speak with your master. Only if you don't have any part of the surprised errand status. Go to verse 1. Well, I don't have any part of the surprised air, uh, surprise Aaron status because I just began, so I'm going to go to verse 1. Urfir is up earlier than usual. As you enter, he hides a large pack behind a curtain, and he turns to you with a wide smile. You're here, lad. Good. Hope you're ready to stretch your legs a bit. I hear a star fell near whitening, and a local tanner picked it up. It's a solid ingot, as large as your ding dingy head. I'd rather not have it fall in the hands of some other smith. You nod. Falling stars are a bad omen for most simple folk, but they always excite blacksmiths and armorers. After all, the legendary Excalibur was forged from one of these cold shards of distant skies. Soon you depart, walking down the sloping fields towards the mist-covered forest. With some rations, your trusty hammer, and a purse of silver Urfir gave you. 
Before stepping into the shadows of the trees, you take one last look back at the ancient statue towering above the shacks and houses. How much longer can this tired old thing protect Kunalakt? Gain part one of the surprising air status. Gain one wealth. We one wealth. Exploration ends. Yay! You have gained your first story related status. Mark it on your tutorial save sheet and write it down on a piece of paper. Their wealth gains one wealth. Take the universal marker and place it in the wealth slot of Bayar's tray. After that, exploration ends. You should return to the game and go to part three first travel. Hoo ha! We're gonna do that. I'm not recording anything in the save sheet because, quite honestly, we're gonna walk through this pretty much step by step by step, and we don't need the save sheet. Your exploration is now finished, and you have a new task. It's time to start moving Bior towards his destination, the cursed farm hold known as Whitening. As you know from your exploration journal, the Whitening is the northeast of your village. To plan the journey, let's study all revealed locations. Something I forgot to do. When I explored, I used an energy. Ah, uh, yes. That'd be on the Actions Overview card. Explore, one energy. Which costs us an energy to travel. And we'll move into Hunter's Grove. When you travel, connect your current location with the direction keys. As we arrive, check that there are any locations connected to Hunter's Grove that you can reveal. You may reveal locations that are connected to your current location with direction keys, the numbered arrows in the corners, or on the sides, sorry, on the sides, and in range of an active min here. They are adjacent, either straight or diagonally, to a location with a min here model. So we can put a, loca a location there and a location there, which we're going to do right now. Well, we found whitening. Whitening is connected right there. We also found the four dweller mounds. Sounds interesting, but we're heading to whitening because that's where we need to be going. But we, have an we now are going to be dealing with our first action on the location. Built-in action on the location. We're going to gather some food. Food is an important resource that we consume at the end of each day. Pay we're going to pay our cost of two energy, so we're going to go from four to two. And we're going to take two food. Again, universal markers that add in. The action also asks us to draw one green encounter. Take the green encounter you've placed near the map, bring the setup. Place a face up so you have plenty of free space to the right of the encounter card. Green encounter. I'll blow these up all on the screen bigger so you can actually see what's going on. It'll be much nicer that way. But for now, I'm just going to play it out like that. You can follow along and the graphics will be popping up on the screen. Read the encounter card carefully. Okay, I'll do that. One second. I'll put, the, I'll put this up on the screen as well. Mist shaped vermin. Encounter value four. You need that many cubes to win. Attribute keys. Place your first card you play here. Combat pool. Put every cube gained here. You can't call yourself a true adventurer until you've killed one. That makes sense. You know, killing rats in dungeons. Combat table. The number of cubes generated determines the enemy's attack. Opportunity run away. Loot. One food. So hey, we got two food. We kill this thing. We get another food. The most important thing really on these cards are the keys. The keys are your key to victory. When you be in combat, you want to go to your combat overview card. It says starting encounter. Draw three cards from the combat deck. If you have four characters, two cards. And check the enemy's traits. So you draw three cards from the top of your combat deck. I'll have these up in the graphic there, but I can take a look at. You do not need to check the counter trait. It has none. We don't need to pack, pick an active character. We only have the one. And there aren't any delayed abilities right now since there are no abilities in play yet. So we can move right on to fighting. We're going to play the attack card and attach it to the right edge of the encounter card. This causes both halves of the aggression key and the bottom golden key to join. You notice how the keys join. You may only connect keys with an attribute icon if you have the attribute. Bayor has two aggression so we can match the two aggression on attack to attach it. This places one cube in the combat pool. The golden bottom key always connects, and it has no requirements. So you place, so I can place one more cube in the combat pool. Now we're going to read the text of the combat card, or the attack card. It has two abilities. The first ability causes all enemy attacks to deal one more wound. The second ability instructs you to place a time token on the attack card. The ability, will be solved, the ability itself will be resolved during the next delayed ability step unless I cover it with another card. 
On each turn, you might only play one card, plus as many additional cards as you connect using their lightning bonus icon. So we're going to play Ignore Pain. It contains a lightning boldness icon that connects the Courage keyword on the previous card. Before placing this card, I'd usually remove the uh, timed token from attack, but I didn't even place one on because I knew we are going to be removing it. Delayed abilities will not trigger, trigger if you cover them up, so there's no time token left anymore once you play this next card. Note the area where the time token would have gone is now completely disappeared. We give the lightning connection to that boar. We don't have any magic to spin, so we can't use that connection. There's a, on the bottom, the very bottom icon, the free icon, contains a plus card bonus action, so we draw a card. Ignore Pain, like the attack card, contains a key, contains a text ability. Just like a text ability, it triggers during the enemy attack step. I have two cards left in my hand, but we're not going to cover the Ignore Pain card for now. We're going to proceed on to the next phase. First we check for a quick victory check. We only have two markers in the, in the uh, attack pool, instead of the four required. So we haven't defeated the enemy yet. So now it's time for the enemy to attack. In Tainted Grail, each enemy has many different moves depending on the value of the combat pool. Bjork currently has two markers in the combat pool, so checking the combat table, the attack value for zero to two markers deals one damage. Move Bjork's health track down one slot. If you'll notice, that marker is a cap on how high those things can get. It caps how much energy you can have, but it causes real problems if your terror is above it. Now we're going to check the Ignore Pain card. Gain one cube for every point, point of damage received. So I can add a cube to the combat pool. Well, hey, look at that. The enemy attacked us, and we heard it in retaliation. Pretty sweet. Now we go to the end of the combat turn. At the end of the combat turn, you must discard until you have three cards in your hand. There's only two in my hand, so I get to draw one card instead. Now we begin the next turn of combat. So let's start with the battle card cry that I just drew. Its free connection contains a bonus card, which means I can draw one more card. I have now drawn the card Throw. It's an excellent card to play right now. It has the lightning keyword in its aggression slot, which we're looking for, so we can connect it. Because the first card we play this turn is a free play. Now, in order to play additional cards, we must be able to connect them with the lightning bonus icons. So we're going to play that card out. It connects by the aggression of the bonus, and at the bottom, it gives us our fourth combat cube. So we can move on to checking victory. We perform the victory check. If there are four markers in the combat pool, we win. There are four markers in the combat pool. The loot for the, in this case is one food. So we'll take one additional food marker and place it in the character tray. I could remove those red ones if I wanted to and place a purple in place of five red, but I'm just going to leave it as that for now. The encounter for us is over. I'm going, in this in the tutorial, I'm just going to place it right back here. In the full game, you would place that card at the bottom of the deck, the encounter deck. And we take all the cards we've played out here, and we shuffle them back into our combat deck. You do that with all played, discarded, and used cards. So all your cards, all the time, will constantly be back in the deck. It's a very convenient thing to have. So of each combat, your combat deck is completely full and ready to go. This is important. Now we're going to come to the end of the day. We've done enough for today. We're down to two energy, and we don't want to get down to those red spots if we don't have to. So we're going to make a pass action. This is going to end our in-game our in-game day. Again, all these instructions are found on your order of the day card. So at the end of the day, you would normally rest, consume one food to restore one health, and lose one uh, terror. If you don't have enough food, drop your energy to zero. It was already at zero. Lose one health instead. So don't go without food if you can avoid it. Restore your energy to full. And the problem is if you're exhausted, you only were to restore four points of energy. And by full, it means up to your chevron. You need special things to go into the plus one, plus two, plus three area. We can advance our character by spending ex uh, in, uh, experience points, but we don't have any, so we can't advance our character. We also have any upgrade cards, so we can't modify our deck. We're in a location with the dream symbol. It's the looks like kind of like a, either an upside down crescent moon or maybe like a closed eyelid. It's a bit odd. I'll, I'll display it on the screen. So in a normal game, we now open the exploration journal, 
at this location and look for that dream. It said in this tutorial, we're going to read the dream from the tutorial instead. Dreams contain both story and text rules. Remember to apply the, the dream's rules. So here's the coming dream. 102, Hunter's Grove. As you walk into the shadow of the Hunter's Grove, your heart beats faster and your wound burns. You died not far from here two weeks ago, though it took some time for you to realize that. You try hard not to think about those events, humming your favorite tune to chase away the memories. Dream. In your dream, you return to the dark ravine, deep in the grove. Like many others, you search for a little girl who went missing in Kunawakt. Instead, you find a mass of what looks like tangled black snakes crawling across the moss-covered stone. The mass rises on countless black legs and rushes you. For a split second, you see the horrific truth what charges a malformed, overgrown, beating heart on countless legs of blacked veins and arteries. It opens its circular maw full of lamprey-like teeth. In the next moment, it's on top of you, ripping into your side and desperately trying to push itself into your chest. With all your strength, you pull, away from, pull it away from the wound, throw it to the ground, and hold it in place with your boot, Crush it with a, and you finally crush it with a swing from your hammer. Then you wake up, alone in the forest, shivering. The wound burns again. You ask the village priestess and herbalist. You try many remedies and quaff foul-smelling mixtures. Still, the wound festers, turning black. You try to fall asleep, but your mind dwells on the, what fate awaits you, and whether a thing like the one you kill, that killed you will emerge you from your chest once you die. Lose one energy, gain one terror. The prophetic dream caused Beor to lose a point of energy and gain a point of terror. Move the markers accordingly. After reading a dream or nightmare, continue the game. In this case, go to part 8, start of the day. A nightmare. Whenever a character's terror is in the red zone of the terror track, slipping in locations with the nightmare icon, or with the dream icon, causes a nightmare instead. Part 8, start the second day. Perform the start of the day actions on the action card, just like before. All we really need to do right now is reduce the min here dial to 6. And then we read the event card. Tired and in pain, you start the final leg of your journey. Hint, some event cards have an additional impact on the game. Remember to apply any rules you find on them. Yay! Right now, we just need to simply go to whitening. That's where we're heading anyways. So we're going to pay the one energy to move to travel. We're going to move Bior to whitening. Whitening has a lightning mark on it. Also, we add no new locations, because any location we'd add here or here would be too far from the min here to actually be added. But we have a lightning icon. This is an instant rule, and we must resolve it as soon as we enter the location. The action instructs us to draw a blue encounter card. Unlike my previous encounter, this is a diplomatic challenge. A very inquisitive guard stops as we enter stops us as we enter our location. Suspicious guard. You'll notice on the one side there's a track. We have the same keys on the one side again, which unfortunately for us is not so convenient because we only have one of those abilities. So affinity track. If a marker is on top of the track in the affinity check, you win. If it's on the bottom, you lose. Start. We're told to put a marker there. Stage. Each stage resets and the track has different rules. Varying bonus. Each not ability or not bonus you connect gives you this ability. There's a response. Failure reward. And what we're doing. We're trying to explain ourselves. So once again, I put the encounter there. We would need to grab our diplomacy help card now, which is on the opposite side of the combat overview card. Once again, we draw three cards. From our diplomacy deck, we place a marker on the gray slot of the infinity track. Uh, affinity track. The markers are a little bit big for those, in my opinion. It also might be useful at this point in time to pull out the icon card and refer reference the diplomacy icons. Up arrow, move the marker up the affinity track one space. Down arrow, move the move the marker on the affinity track down one space. Not. Check the effect on the encounter card next to the encounter stage of the encounter card. We're going to play I for detail. Only one of our keys connects, and it has the not symbol. It's a special diplomacy bonus that varies depending on the encounter card and the stage of the encounter. In this stage, every not will yield one up movement on the affinity track. Then we're going to place a time to token on I for detail card, as it has a delayed ability. So we're going to now move on to the affinity check. Since we're not going to be playing a second card, we're not using... Any lightning connections, we're just going to end this round of our encounter. And so we're going to do the affinity check on the opponent's card. The enemy's response is, move us down one space. So, we went up one, now we go down one. Whee! So 
And then we, in our turn, we discard down to three cards and then draw back up, and then draw up three if we don't have three. The new turn begins, and Bjor is something that's here from the delayed ability step. We remove the time token from the eye for detail card, and then we draw one card. We're going to play Misdirection as our first card. The bottom connects with a times two multiplier, get, granting us two up increases. One, two. Then we're going to play our brand new card, Threatening Voice. It has a lightning icon in the bottom key, and it connects. Then we read the effect on the card. The text lesson card instructs us to lose one reputation, but we don't have any, so nothing happens. And, if your character has two aggression, which we certainly do, we move the track up one slot, or the marker up one slot on the affinity track. Hey, that's the top. We're on the last stage, which means we win, and we get the reward. The reward for the defeating these things is one reputation. Hey, we didn't have any, now we have some. Awesome. As per usual... We take the cards we didn't play, and the cards we did play, and we'll shuffle them back in the Diplomacy deck, so they're ready to go in the future. The blue card, if you don't want to play the one encounter, would go on the bottom of your encounter deck usually, but for us, we just place it there. But now that we're actually in Whitening itself, we need to explore Whitening. We're going to pay one energy, and usually when you explore a card, you read the back side. But we're not doing that, because once again, we're playing via the tutorial, so we'll just go to the tutorial page in the back of the book. 107 Whitening. The hole is here, as always, gaping at the heart of Whitening. The white lichen that gave this town its name, its new name, seems to grow out of it. It covers the walls of the nearby halls with a thick coat. Only close up can one discover that it is, in fact, a layer of small sparkling crystals like sea salt on the wooden posts of a pier. As you inspect it, several people watch you suspiciously. You shrug your arms to show that you're not interested in their secrets. Go to verse 7. The book on the back is kind of funny. Verse 1, underneath it says, If you're reading this, you misunderstood instructions from this location's introduction. It sent you to verse 7, so you should go here. So we go to verse 7. There's no love lost between Kunawakt and the Whitening. You shouldn't stay here too long. We have the option of visiting the village Tanner, go to verse 9, or ask the Whiteners about their men here, go to verse 5. Well, for thoroughness' sake, we should just go to... Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, bothersome and ask the, the uh, Whiteners about their men here. Your question spurs no kindness, so instead of relying on them, you approach the guardian men here to see it for yourself. It looks a lot like the one in your town, but something is off. The sensation you experience around Kunawak's monument, an indescribable feeling that the world is suddenly more in focus, is gone. So the rumors were true. Whitening's men here is now a dead piece of stone. Gain one terror and one experience. So our terror goes up one. You know, I gain an experience. Go to verse 7 and make another choice. Well, the only other choice available to us is to visit the tanner. So we're going to go visit the tanner. Go to verse 9. You ask around about the tanner if you wanted you to find, and draw some, and you draw some strange looks. Finally, someone tells you this man moved out several months ago. Angry and confused, you reach the tannery, only to find the building abandoned and covered in cobwebs. What is going on? Is this a cruel joke? Gain one terror. Boy, we're just getting scared of everything right now. Gain part two of the surprised Aaron status. Woo-woo, we have both parts. We're done with this uh, location now. You have to get back to Kunawak's fast. Travel to Hunter's Grove, as before. Perform a travel action and pay one to move Bior to, one, to, to this location. Well, there's no reason to stop right now. We really want to get back to town. So we're going to take another energy and move to location 101. Hometown, or Cone Hometown. We're now exhausted. This is important because Festering Wound is his problem. Lose one health every time you become exhausted. So we drop down. Tired and exhausted. Tired, in pain and exhausted. Bior is ready to conclude his journey. We're going to pay one energy to, to explore Kunawak. And as before, we're going to go to the journal instead of flipping the card. Because remember, last time we explored, we didn't have that two parts of the uh, surprise errand. And now we do. So we'll be able to read the next half. We're here for the second time. So if you're here for the second time, you should read part two of the choices because you now have two parts of Surprising Errand. Go to verse two. You enter Kunawakt exhausted and in pain, yet even in this condition you quickly realize something happened to your, in your absence. 
Many sad-eyed townfolk, townsfolk walk the streets or argue in small groups. Startled, you look towards the men here, but it seems fine, surrounded by ribbons flapping in the wind. There's no weirdness in Kunawak. So what could draw these people out of their houses? As you approach the forge, you almost stumble upon the boy who usually delivered Erfir's messages. They're gone, the boy tells you. They left at the break of day. Erfir wants you to take care of his workshop. You stumble into the building only to find it empty, save for a note lying on the workbench. Held securely in place by a heavy ingot of star iron. Three times you attempted to read the parchment, your eyes watering from helpless rage. It says Erfir left Kunok without you, traveling with Lord Yvrain, Fael, Albert, and Neante. They headed for Cam uh, Camelot, where they hoped to find you find help for your town. You were deemed too weak for this journey. You were not good enough. A silent rage grows within you. Go on with the exhaustion and the pain. You need to forge and look to the east. Somewhere there, behind roiling mists, clouds of weirdness, and dangerous trails, the Kunwak champions journey on. You're sure you will find them. Each party member gains one terror. Boy, I'm just really terrorized right now. Congratulations, you have finished the tutorial scenarios. You'll find Erfir's letter in the game box. It'll pray for the first chapter of the Fallen, Fall of Avalon campaign. I'm not going to actually read the letter, because I want you to actually get the game and play it on your own and actually enter it. If you do get this, I do suggest you have your have other players play this as kind of a collective group to run through this opening scenario. It's very useful in learning the mechanics of the game, such as how the symbols link up on the combat cards, and how you move and explore around the places. Also, how you read the journal, and so forth. It's it's a nice little step through the thing. It's a really wonderfully designed and set up scenario for, for an introductory game. I honestly wish more games came like this. This was a very brilliant part, a very, very, a very brilliant uh, tactic of Awakened Realms. They really give you a good jump in for the game. Because you can play the tutorial and you can carry on with it. Or you can simply start the game from the very beginning. So it's really kind of nice. Because you may not you know, want to play with Bayor, you may want to play with uh, more people. Because this is a cooperative game, up to four players, so it's very nice. Kind of wish it went to five, because they give you a fifth character in the box, just not everything to play with the fifth character. It's kind of too bad. But, uh, yeah. Overall, I really like the game. I love the uh, the theme of it. It's very kind of cool, the idea of you like being like the B-Squad in an Arthurian legend. It's a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy with the game. I, I've really, I really enjoy what I've played with it. I've played one full session with some friends, and then the pandemic hit. So this has been sitting around for a while. Uh, I wish I'd done a review for it earlier, but I hadn't gotten to it. So I decided I, I should pull it out and do one for it, because it's such a nice game. It's so beautifully done. And Awaken Realm makes some of the most dense, heavy, awesome games out there. I mean, like, they're like just like these wonderful storytelling experiences. As much as, like, like I play a lot of games. I, I really love Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a lot of fun. It's a great cooperative game. And its real challenge is actually defeating the scenarios, because that's where the interesting parts come from in it. The story of Gloomhaven is a little bit on the weak side. I wish it was more powerful. Whereas in this, the story is really powerful. The combat may pale a little bit, I'm, I'm thinking. I mean, the combat looks kind of, kind of pretty simple. As long as you draw the right cards, you're going to be in good shape. If you draw the wrong cards, you can probably be screwed. So, very, very card dependent. But you can customize your decks, you're leveling up your characters. That's that's a very important uh, part of it. So, this is super story heavy. I mean, like you saw, the I showed the book off. I'll show it off one more time again. It is, it's a dense tome. This thing is, there's some story here. That's a lot of pages of story. And uh, there are expansions to the game as well. So, you can have even more fun with that. So, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I really like it. Uh, it's beautiful. I love the aesthetic. The artwork is just phenomenally gorgeous throughout the whole thing, too. It's fantastic. I love to play more of it. I love to play more games right now, but of course there's the pandemic going on, so gaming has been at a minimum. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. Uh, I would definitely appreciate that a lot. And uh, we'll see you for the next game. Sayonara.